O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Was set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou might still the enemy and the avenger. Let's all pray together. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can meet together in this way. We thank you for the wonders of modern technology that enable us to meet, even though separated by miles. And we ask that thou would bless each and every one of us, that you would come upon us, O Lord, by your Spirit, make us attentive to your word and what you are saying to us. We pray you'd bless each and every one as we enter into the worship of you the ever-living God, in and through your Son, whom you have sent for us. Amen. We'll now have our first hymn. Let's all turn to the book of Psalms, Psalm 2. Actually, we'll read from Psalm 1. So, book of Psalms, the first and second Psalms. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counts of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. 
and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Psalm 2 Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O you kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Let's all bow in prayer together. Gracious and glorious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of your blessed Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to worship you, the one true and living God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We seek to worship you. We bow ourselves in your presence. We come with adoration We think of what you have done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We think that you are the creator of all things and over all things, infinite, almighty, eternal, unchanging God. We bow before you. We admit that you are our God. We confess that you've made all things and made us and we were made in your image. And yet we confess, O God, we've fallen from you that we fall short of your standard, your righteous standard. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We realise, O Lord, we fall short in every single respect, that we do not have an automatic entry into heaven, into the eternal blessed place and into your presence. And so we thank you there is only one, there is one way for us to come, the way that you have made in your wonderful Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We confess our great need of him. We confess that we are sinners in your sight who deserve nothing but wrath and condemnation and to be cast out into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Our sins are a testimony against us. And yet we thank you for a gracious saviour, even your son, who is prepared to come into this sinful world, who condescended to be found here in human nature, fully God, fully man, able to represent us. One who lived a perfect life, one who went to that cross and died in our place, being our substitute, bearing our sins away. We thank you for so great salvation. We thank you for such a gracious saviour as our Lord Jesus Christ, who could not be holden of death, but bursts its bands asunder and rose again, and is now seated at your right hand. We thank you that we have a gracious saviour, an advocate on high, a mediator between us, that we are set free from all our sin by him who loved us and gave himself for us. We confess him as our saviour, and we ask you to bless us as we anticipate his coming again into this wonderful, into this evil world, to bring in his eternal reign and his righteous kingdom, 
which will have no end. We thank you for all these things. We thank you for the truth. We thank you that we find it before us in these pages, centering on this glorious person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll now sing our second hymn. Let's all turn in the New Testament to Ephesians chapter 6. The epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Ephesians, chapter 6. And we'll begin reading at verse 10. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and a supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. But that ye also may know my affairs and how I do, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that you might know our affairs, and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren, 
and love with faith from God and the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Let's bow together in prayer. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we come before thee to give thee thanks. We thank thee that we can open thy word together. We thank you for all your blessings to us. We thank you that we can know the truth and the truth has set us free. And so we come before you to pray for each and every one gathered here at this moment, those who might listen at a future date, and also all your people throughout the world. We pray for each and every one. We pray for our unity in the Lord Jesus Christ, that it might be kept and preserved as thou has commanded us to do. We pray for those who are suffering and are struggling and are passing through various temptations and trials at this time. We pray that you draw near to each and every one and help them. We pray that you'd bless those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Maybe they do that alone, O oh Lord. Maybe they feel they are suffering hunger and coldness and loneliness. And so we pray for each and every one of them who suffers in that particular way that you would draw near to them that you would calm their hearts and give them a great assurance of the truth that they know in their hearts. We pray you bless them in their sufferings and trials and they might look forward to that great day when the Lord Jesus Christ will return, when there'll be that heavenly reign, that reign of righteousness and peace and blessing which will know no end. We pray for our nation with all its ills, with all its sin, with all its darkness, with all its chaos and confusion. We ask you, O Lord, to bless this nation once more. You've blessed it in the past, and so we ask you that you'd bless it again. We pray for our Queen and our government, and we ask you to help them to form laws and do those things which are pleasing to you. O great God, help us at this time. Rend the heavens. Revive your work, O Lord. Stir our hearts up to serve you, to walk with you day by day, whatever our circumstances might be. O oh Lord, bless each and every one for the sake and for the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we come to the word, we'll just sing a third time. So now the third hymn.
I turn your attention this evening to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to consider in particular those verses that we read together from 10 to 24, our spiritual battle. But I wanted to very much put it into the context of this great letter, these six great chapters. And you might know that Ephesians is unusual in that it's very clear in the division between the two halves of the letter. The first half being the truth, the doctrine, the wonderful glorious facts of what we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the second half, the outworking of that. If these things be so, then let's see it in your life, is what Paul says to these Ephesians, and therefore to us. But as an overview, we can say that this letter of Ephesians, perhaps more than any other book in the Bible and in the New Testament, deals with the spiritual realm. We start by soaring up into the heavenlies, realising what we are in the Lord Jesus Christ if we belong to him. The facts of being in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul starts by stating what we are in him. We could put it like this. We have an identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a new identity. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When we're born into the world, new baby, we've had the wonderful blessing of uh, new babies uh, related to the congregation, actually three in very recent months, a wonderful thing, always a, a great time of joy when a, a, a new child is safely delivered into the world. And each and every one of those babies, though unaware of it, has an identity. They have been born into a certain nation, they've been born into a certain family, they have a certain character, and they will develop certain preferences, things that they like and dislike, and so on, growing in human life, in human terms. But they have an identity. And so we have an identity as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in a sense, it all centres on this glorious person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's really Paul's great purpose in the first three chapters, for us to realise exactly what we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. The enormity of it, the vastness of it, the riches of Christ, the unsearchable riches of Christ. We're taken up to the heavens and we start to understand what we are and who he is and what he means to us. We don't need to know those things to be saved. One man was quoted, I'm not sure if it's a, a real quote, but I, I don't have reason to doubt it. And he said, somebody asked him about his faith and he replied like this, I'm a poor sinner and nothing at all. Jesus Christ is my all in all. A very simple profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need to know very much to be a Christian. We need to know something about our, our sinfulness and our need of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and what he's done. And we put our trust in that. And that's um, faith, as small as a mustard seed, is able to do great things, as the Lord Jesus Christ said. But it's good to know the things that Paul talks about in the first three chapters. We don't need to know them or understand them to be a believer but when we read those things and we understand those things and we realise what we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, it does something to us. It's invigorating and it strengthens us. The truth of what it is to be a Christian. We are partakers of the heavenly realm. And this really comes out in terms of principalities and powers. Really, we have the created order, God, triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit over and above all things the infinite, the eternal and then we come down to the world the world of men the pinnacle of God's creation created in God's image 
Then the animal kingdom, separate but related to human beings. Human beings are a special creation. One race that God has created to dominate the earth, subdue it in a, in a good way. And of course, that's been done to a greater or less extent. It's been abused as well, but um, that's a, another subject. And yet in between, there are these powers and these principalities and rulers of the world under God. And of course, one third of the angels were motivated to follow Lucifer, the devil, Satan, and fell. And so we have this spiritual realm with these various beings that are unseen, yet very powerful, and they dominate things. The unseen, the spiritual realm. Over and above God, then the spirit beings, the angels, and the fallen angels, and then man on the earth. And so it's interesting how Paul puts this. If we turn to the very first chapter, he talks about his great prayer and desire for every believer. That's for, for me and for you and for these Ephesian, Ephesian Christians. He says in verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Those are the things that he's talking about. When we understand these things, it does something to us. We, we grow in grace and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. What a wonderful truth and declaration of the position of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, the point is our position in him. Listen to how he carries on and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. The greatness of the gospel, the greatness of God's work in the world, centering on his glorious son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he carries on in the next chapter, chapter two. And you, as he quickened, quickened in the sense the spirit has come and done something, motivated, stirred up, who were dead in trespasses and sins. You started to see the truth. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or conduct in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the, of, of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The spiritual realm, what it means to be a believer. We're taken into this new understanding of the spiritual realm and the things of God, the things of eternity. These become the most important things. These are things that dominate that's what they should do. I understand the daily grind, but then to have these thoughts in our mind, to remember what we are in the Lord Jesus Christ, it motivates, it changes, it does something. And then he carries on in the next chapter, chapter three, we'll begin reading at verse eight. He talks about his own ministry, a wonderful, glorious ministry of the Apostle Paul. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. What a privilege it is to get into this pulpit and to expound this word like this. This is the greatest activity of man. To preach the word, to hear the word preached. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world 
has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. We are involved in this great spiritual realm and this great spiritual battle, as we'll see in a while. Then he starts to round up this section, these first three chapters, in verse 14. And Paul cannot help himself but throw himself on his knees and pray to God and worship. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. What glorious chapters they are, what glorious truths, and how we need to pay attention to them. So that then is the, the, the doctrinal section, as you were. It is the truth of what we are in Christ Jesus. And then he turns to the practical in the last three chapters. So you, you read through ch chapters one to three, and you, you're taken up to heaven. You read these glorious things of what we are in the Lord Jesus Christ if we belong to him. That being so, this, then this, then this. The practical section. How does it work itself out in our lives? Well, it's an interesting way I'd like us to look at this today. And I do, I draw this to your attention and bring this emphasis out by asking you a question. How has the Lord ordered the lives of men? And particularly, how has he ordered the world and the, the functioning of society and the lives of men to benefit us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he's really given three units for us to live in. And you'll see that working itself out in these chapters as we follow through. There is the church of Jesus Christ. That is one unit. As believers, we're all joined together. We're in one body who Jesus himself being the head. We are joined. That's why there is a unity which we are to keep, which we'll see. Then there is the nation. The Lord has set bounds of our habitation. The nation, that's another unit of life. Very important because nations need governments. Governments are there as a bare minimum to protect us, to protect us, our lives and also our property. And that's really a minimum requirement for any government if it's um, going to be blessed and do the right thing. And of course then, thirdly and finally, the family, which of course was the first one. Mother, father, children, a family. That's a unit. And of course this is so relevant to our current day that we should emphasise these units, the church, the nation, the family because they are being attacked, being attacked. And we're going to look at that together. We think of Adam and Eve, and then the two sons, and so on, and then the rest of the children. The first family. And so that was the first unit that came into the world. When God made man, he made a help, a helper, who answered to his needs, and then they had children, and that was a family. Then... We think a bit further on in the history of the world. We think of Babel, which was a great disaster, and the judgment that came, the confounding of a language, so that everyone spoke different languages and couldn't understand one another, so they were formed into nations, and they spread and populated the earth. God judged them to do what they should have done. They should have spread and dominated the earth, but they wanted to make themselves into God, and then God judged them. And so what should have happened by their own uh, progress, God did instead. 
Uh, and so we have nations and languages throughout the world. And we thank the Lord for that, that we have these boundaries between one and another. And then, of course, you have Abraham in the very next chapter, chapter 12 of Genesis. Called out, and so the church starts with him. Called to leave his family, to leave what he knew, his background, and he was called to follow God because he was living in a godless place. And then from him grew the, the patriarchs, the remnant from the nation of Israel was always there, the spiritual remnant in that great nation. And then we get to Pentecost when the Holy Spirit is given and the church uh, in its fullness is inaugurated and the gospel goes to the Gentiles. And so we now have uh, the church, not just in the nation of Israel, but throughout the world. And most places you go in the world, you, you can find believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is so wonderful. One church, many nations, many families. Those are the units that God has given to us. Well, the devil is attacking these. And that's why we need to heed these exhortations of Paul as we go through and we need to understand the spiritual battle that we're engaged in. The devil has a name. He wants to ruin our witness. He wants to make suggestions that will ruin our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to divide us. And he has many tactics and many ways that we see it working out itself out in families, in nations, and in the church. And that's why we must give great attention to this wonderful letter. But God has a name, and we can overcome. We can, have, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. He says that we, should, we are to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that we might be filled with all the fullness of of God. And so we see it working itself out in these various units one by one. The first one he deals with is the church. How are we to live in the church? Well, we have a unity which is to be kept. In chapter 4, verse 3, it says, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That is to describe us, that is to be our daily uh, task. We have a unity, it is to be kept. It's really, really important. And we see how that's been very much challenged in the present time. And reading on a bit further down, we read the summary of this section about our conduct one to another, believer to believer. And he says in verse 15, speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. There's a huge amount in that verse, I, I understand, but it amounts to this, that we, we, as, we unit, as, we, as we are brought together in the Lord Jesus Christ, and as we keep that unity, we grow in that unity, the body grows numerically, number of believers being added, but also in strength, in maturity, until we come to walk with the Lord and reflect the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. We are to be mature. But that's the easier bit, easiest bit, because for many, that is just on the Lord's Day, where we meet with other believers, maybe for a few hours. Um, it's important, it's difficult to do, but it's harder when it, it's every day. And of course, that relates to our neighbours. We live in a nation with other people. Some of them are Christian, some of them are not. In our day, many, most, are not Christians. We might be working in a small company and we're the only believer. And that is a great struggle. How are we to do that? How are we to live for the Lord? In, those place, in that place, how do you live for our neighbours? This needs to be worked out. And so Paul gives us great help in this. I'll just quote a few words uh, from chapter 4. 
that you put off concerning the form of conduct the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, it's interesting, I was listening to Stuart Hollier and he said that he didn't think this was something that we do, but it's a fact about us. When we became believers, we put off the old man and put on the new man. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. We are changed. We're to live in that way. We're to live according to that new nature, to follow the new man, to live the new life of the new man. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, which, of course, Paul expounds in Romans 12, the first verses of that chapter. Really, it comes down to this, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Be you therefore followers of God as dear children. So it's a picture of interest to me, a family, the family of God. And what we find is, as we go through the world, we are to follow God, not the devil. That's what everybody else is in. They're following the devil and his ways. They're on the broad road, which leads to destruction. And we need to be those who are on the narrow way and live that way. And we follow Father, God. Abba Father, we follow God. That's how we, that's really a summary way of, of looking at this. Followers of God. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. It's as if it got to a point when Enoch was one third of the life of his contemporaries. They obviously had a, 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 a nearly a thousand year life expectancy at that time. And it's as if the Lord looked down upon him and said, I cannot stand for my servant to be in that evil, sinful world anymore. I'm going to take him to be with myself. And that was his testimony, that God took him. Followers of God as dear children, a family, God's family. And so he works this out in various ways, ways that we are to walk. Followers of God, we're walking along, through life, we are to walk in love. Verse 2, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. We walk in love, but also we are to walk in light. For we were sometimes darkness, that's the past, that's what we were like, that's what described us, but now are ye light in the Lord. The Spirit's work, the Bible has become understood. We have the mind of Christ. Light has been shed in our lives, a light of God. We're different. We can see. Walk as children of light. We walk in the light. And also we need the wisdom of God. If we look down at chapter 5, verse 15, we read these words. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, walk in wisdom, walk in wisdom. That is what is to describe the Christians. And then he summarizes this section by this, by bringing it back to um, the, the church, interestingly, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And so we've looked at how we are to live with our fellow believers, keeping the unity, growing in grace, edifying one another, and in the world with our neighbours, next door neighbours, friends at work, colleagues, whatever it might be, we are to walk in these various ways as dear children, followers of God, submitting ourselves one to another in the fear of God. But then it works itself out in the most important one of all. There's a very sad little um, adage that was said of, of somebody, I don't know if, if it was someone in particular or just a general thing. A saint abroad, a devil at home. That was invented or was to describe the kind of man that everybody applauds in the world, maybe in the church, maybe at work or in other places. But if you were to see his family life and how he was at home you'd see a different person believers are not to be like that 
That's a terrible thing. And of course, this is the point. It's the hardest to live for Christ in our own home. Those who are closest to us know our foibles and our weaknesses and the points where we trip and stumble. And so that seems to be the reason that Paul deals with this last. The thing about the family is there is a hierarchy in the family. We have, all have our place. And that's why the family, that's how the family functions properly, is when we all are in our place and we understand our role and we fulfill that role under God. And so Paul tells wives submit to the husband. Husbands love your wives. Children, servants, obey. And masters, be just. He says in chapter 6, verse 9, and you masters do the same things unto them, things he's been talking about with the, the, the servants, You're not to be a hypocrite, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is the respect of persons with him. So in the relationship with your master, the Lord Jesus Christ, you are to be to your servants, the ones that who you rule in that way. Specifically, of course, the home where there is servants, or maybe it sometimes actually were slaves. Uh, it says, say bond or free at the end of uh, verse eight. And, but we can apply that, I think, a bit more widely in our day to the workplace. But specifically, of course, it's to do with, with the home. These are God's ways. Now, of course, as we said before, all these things are being attacked. The church is being attacked. The nation is being attacked. The family is being attacked in various ways. It's very complex, very confusing, very difficult. How far are we to go? Well, of course, we are to obey God and not men. And so that's the line that's drawn. But for some, the line's in a slightly different place. Even though we understand what that means to obey God, it's how it applies. That's the hard thing, applying it. But more than that, according to this chapter, we want to think about how the spiritual realm is influencing these things. And why we see the difficulty in the world at this present time and the struggles. And so we need to give our attention to what God requires of us and what God is explaining to us. There is no coincidence that these things are being attacked. We read in that psalm at the beginning that this is what's happening. There's a, there's a battle going on. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? It's vain to think they can fight with God and, and beat God. That is impossible. But look how they work. Look how it operates. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Let's divide the church. Let's divide nations. Let's divide the family. They can't get to the Lord. The devil cannot attack Jesus Christ himself, and so he attacks his people, his body. Can't get, reach the head, so he attacks the body. That's how it's working itself out. You remember when, before Saul was converted, became Paul, that he was persecuting the church. And when he was thrown on the ground on that road to Damascus, the bright light above the midday shining sun and the voice it's hard to kick against the pricks Paul was being goaded I think that Stephen's sermon was eating his heart out and it was he was pushing against it the Lord was goading him to salvation and to be what he became but he was resisting and, and it hurt that is it. That's what we find ourselves, you see. The devil is doing that. He's working in the lives of people. And sadly, he also sometimes, very often, works in the life of believers in various different ways. And so we have this great picture of being a soldier. Each and every one who's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ 
is a soldier in this great spiritual battle in the Lord's army. Put on the whole armour of God, he says. Well, of course, a soldier needs to do that. So we're involved in this spiritual battle. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The battle is raging and yet the victory is already won. And that's our great hope. That's our great motive for daily going into the battle prepared. How do we do that? Well, what does an army do? Let's just say that uh, Britain was being attacked, which isn't that long ago that it happened, although it wasn't using the army, of course. So perhaps not the best illustration. But an army is there to defend. So they have to stand their ground and stop the enemy from getting through, breaking through. And then, of course, they, they need to advance and maybe take ground back that's been, been lost. And so that is with us. It, it's, we, we're told that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And so we actually have a mandate, as it were, and we have that promise that when we go into the devil's territory, which, of course, the whole world is in a sense, we are able to grasp hold of his prisoners and set the captives free. We do that by the gospel, and that works itself out wonderfully in this, this chapter. We are soldiers, soldiers of the cross. We're in a, a great battle, a spiritual battle against principalities, against the great powers of darkness of this world. Look, look how Paul puts it. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, his tricks and his tactics and his subtlety. You need to understand his, um, his tactics, his device, his plans. He has a plan uh, to win the war. Although he can't win, yet he still seeks to make progress. And so we look at these two things that we are to do. We are to defend and we're to advance. Defend, advance. That's what an army should do. And we defend by taking on the whole armour. Each part has its place and its usefulness. And we cannot leave a part out. We have to take the whole armour. The emphasis is on the whole. All the parts that the Lord has given to us to take, we are to take them. And so we read about those in the following verses. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand, to stand your ground, to not enable the wicked powers to make progress, to defend the truth as it is in Christ Jesus, to live for him. What does it come down to? Well, let's just read through the various parts. Verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So those are the parts of the armour for defending. We'll look at the ones for advance in a minute. What does this come down to? Well, really, it relates back to those first three chapters, understanding the gospel. That's why it's important to not just be saved. And thank God it's that way around, that we have, we're saved, not knowing very much. But by reading the scriptures, by study, by meditating upon it, we know more. We understand about the righteousness of Christ, that we are seen by God as complete and entire and perfect in him. The Lord, our righteousness. My beauty are my glorious dress, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a clothing, as a covering. Therefore, being justified by faith, you have peace with God. We know that when we understand the scriptures, the truth, the gospel, Romans, first three chapters of Ephesians, and that invigorates us and we're able to defend because we know what the truth is. That's what we're to do. That's basically what Paul means there. If you want to have a detailed exposition, I commend to you well, two works. There is the sermons of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, which you can get online, and also the printed sermons from Ephesians. There's actually two volumes on this last section of Ephesians. I commend those to you. Um, but also the great classic work by William Gurnall, 
the Christian in complete armour. So we're just looking generally at this. We defend by taking the various parts of the armour. We are to know the gospel. It is to give us joy and peace and hope when we see what we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Basically, when we understand the first three chapters of Ephesians, we're able to stand in an evil day such as we're living in. But then there's another thing, we're to make advance and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. It's interesting how Paul drops the illustration somewhat. He talks about the armour and he gets to the, the sword, which we are to make advance with. Helmet salvation, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's what takes us forward. That's how the, the kingdom of God grows. That's how a nation becomes more Christian, by having more Christians in it who are stronger. We want two things. We want more Christians. We want stronger Christians, more mature Christians, growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, as Peter puts it. We are to grow we are to advance, and we do that by wielding the word of God. Or really, the two weapons that we have, the word of God, the Bible, preaching, and prayer. The word of God, what God, God has spoken. So God speaks to us through his word. And we pray to him. The connection of the two things. That is how we make progress by exercising these wonderful blessings and benefits the word of God and prayer preach the word be instant in season out of season the same thing is said of prayer we are to be always in all, with with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and Paul finishes by talking about his own need and the fact that he as an apostle has a particular need for prayer. And we can apply that obviously to your pastor and those who have responsibility in the church, those who are in are missionaries and those kind of things who are on the front line. We have various people in this country like uh, Patrick Sukdio, for example, who's on the front line. Ken Ham, people like that who are uh, right on the front line. We pray for them in particular. But every believer, because it says all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And so we have this wonderful letter telling us about the spiritual realm, what we are in Christ Jesus, and the fact that we're in this great spiritual battle and what we need to do. We need to, be, to watch and pray. We need to be those who understand the scriptures and more particularly those who understand the truth of the word of God, what we are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's all pray together. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together in this way. We thank you that we can come with your word open. We thank you for the work of your spirit in our hearts. We thank you for granting us understanding. We pray that we might take these words and take them seriously, realize that we, you are speaking to us and you are telling us what we should do and how we are to live and conduct ourselves in this world. And we thank you for these various units which you put for our benefit to help us in human life the family, the nation, the church. We pray that each might be preserved and that the tricks and wiles of the devil might be turned back. O oh Lord, in this great day where we see a tide of evil come upon us, we pray, O oh Lord, that the tide might be turned back. Help us to grow strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. So bless us, each and every one, for his sake. Amen. Now we sing our fourth hymn.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.